Well, hello, Ohio, and welcome to the National Cybersecurity Center's Cybersecurity for State Leaders program. I'm Forrest Senti, Vice President of Programs and Operations here at the NCC. And I'm Maddie Gullickson, Program Director of our Secure the Vote initiative. We are excited to be with you today. The National Cybersecurity Center, or NCC for short, as you can see our background here, is a Colorado-based nonprofit dedicated to cyber innovation and raising awareness of pressing cybersecurity issues. Our programs cover cyber education, election security work, and a co-development of the first ever Space Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Our mission is simply to do what we can to secure the world, and that's why we're excited about this program today. Did you know that roughly 95% of data breaches come from government, technology, and retail sectors? Governments are huge targets, not only just for their data, but also for the fact that they deliver critical services. And as leaders in state government, you are the front lines in helping to defend against ongoing attacks. You are the front lines of democracy. And with the people here today, by championing things like investments in cybersecurity for your state, or even just modeling strong cybersecurity practices for your colleagues and your constituents, you are all leading the way to a stronger cyber future for all of us. And that's why we've designed today's training, with you as legislators and legislative staff in mind. We know you're busy, and so if you need to drop off at any point during today's live session, we've created an on-demand, self-paced option for you to take to complete today's modules. This can be accessed at any time via cyberforstateleaders.org. Once you've finished today's training, or finished the training on your own time, you can take a short post-training survey and you'll receive a certificate demonstrating your completion as well as dedication to advancing cybersecurity in your state. We've developed a dashboard on our website that will track the number of certificates per state, so make sure to get your certificate and share it through your LinkedIn or social media channels to do your state proud. Okay, before we get started, we want to say a huge thank you to the speakers who have shared their time and thoughts with us, and to Google for supporting this initiative and helping to make it possible. And to set the stage for the program, we are grateful to have our CEO, retired Lieutenant General Harry Radege. General Radege served for over 35 years in the Air Force, working across multiple sectors of information technology, communications, space network, and cyber operations. Hello, state leaders. I'm Harry Radge, CEO of the National Cybersecurity Center, and I thank you for joining this training session. Cybersecurity could not be a more critical issue at this time, and I am grateful that so many of you are willing to take this time to learn how to defend yourselves against cyber attacks. I have worked in the areas of network operations and cybersecurity my entire career from protecting the global information networks of the Department of Defense to developing cybersecurity risk management programs throughout various sectors of government, industry, and academia. I've had real life frontline experiences in protecting, defending, and restoring information networks from physical attacks, like establishing the restoration priorities for over 5 million circuits in New York City following the 9-11 terrorist attacks, to fighting cybercrime, espionage, and service denial attacks across both public and private enterprises. As I look across the landscape of what we now know as cyberspace, I see more opportunities for connectivity, collaboration, and innovation than ever before. But at the same time, I also see the rise of foreign threat actors, criminal organizations, and nefarious individuals who can do nearly irreparable damage with a few swift keystrokes. Never before have we dealt with such instantaneous threats, leveled against every sector of society, working daily against our individual identities and assets, critical service distribution systems, information trustworthiness, and the integrity of our most important critical infrastructures. The most recent Microsoft Exchange vulnerability, targeted at the tail of the SolarWinds incident, reveals just how important cybersecurity has become at the federal, state, and local levels of government. And of course, the recent scare at the Florida Water Treatment Facility only makes the connection between cyberspace and our physical space that much more real. Issues like these that states and localities are facing today 
underline why your participation in this cybersecurity training is so important. State governments provide many services and functions that are critical to maintaining the integrity of our democracy, and you are a critical part of the defense of those activities. So not only do I hope that this raises your level of engagement on cybersecurity topics, but I hope you take advantage of individual cyber best practices shared here today, because by doing so, you are strengthening your state's operations and defenses. Thank you and enjoy the training. Well, thanks again for that message, General. And a fun fact for our audience here today, um, General Radke actually is from Ohio, went to Capital University. It's mm -hmm. kind of a fun little piece. So he loves Ohio. So he was excited that you were doing this today. Mm -hmm. So, and with that, let's go ahead and dive into some of the modules and talk a little bit some of the categories we're going to talk about today. So a lot of the things we're going to talk about today are going to include an overview of why cybersecurity matters for your state. So we're going to have a panel that's going to be moderated by your Ohio State CIO, Irvin Rogers, um, Secretary of State Frank LaRose, State Representative Rick Carfagna, and State Senator Vernon Sykes. Uh, after that, we'll share a breakdown of some of the major attacks that you could potentially be a victim of. And finally, we're going to outline some key steps that you can take immediately to start better securing yourself. So please keep in mind, though, during all of this, that in spite of the challenges of pulling a training together like this in the midst of the pandemic, the benefit is that we've been able to bring together a series of experts from all over the country, like you'll see today. Um, and while we personally, as you can see, have the opportunity to use the studio in the making of some of our videos, uh, other experts were kind enough to bring us into their homes and their offices. So some of those experts are people like former Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity Deputy Undersecretary Mark Weatherford. And I love <laughs> how long they make some good things. title <laughs> and senior experts and researchers at places like Google, Microsoft, IBM. And we even have a special message from one of your people, an Ohio native, a former chief external affairs officer for the cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency at DHS and current VP of cybersecurity practice for targeted victory, Kevin Bonacci. And because we have limited time, we've also added a section of additional discussions and updates on election security. Um, small Business Administration Cybersecurity Resources, as well as tips from experts on how to prepare for and respond to cyber attacks. So we'll continue to add additional materials throughout the year, so keep an eye out. Thank you for that preview for us. And to kick us off for today's special training in Ohio, we are grateful to have Lieutenant Governor Houston share a special message about today's training. Good morning. I'm Lieutenant Governor John Husted. Thank you to the National Cybersecurity Center for taking on this initiative to engage state legislatures across the country on the importance of cybersecurity. As the former Secretary of State, I know all too well of the importance of ensuring the integrity of data, securing information, and conveying that confidence to the public. And as Lieutenant Governor, I continue to remain focused on cybersecurity through my role as Director of Innovate Ohio which is the home of Cyber Ohio and the Innovate Ohio platform. Cyber Ohio was established as a collection of cybersecurity initiatives aimed at helping Ohio businesses fight back against cyber attacks. The goal of Cyber Ohio is simple. We want to provide the best legal, technical, and collaborative cybersecurity environment as possible to help Ohio's businesses thrive and keep Ohioans' data and personal information secure. The passage of Senate Bill 220, an achievement of the Cyber Ohio team, provides great protection to businesses that adopt a cybersecurity framework. And the Innovate Ohio platform provides a definitive digital identity promoting security, privacy, and the compliance with applicable standards. I challenge my team every day to make Ohio the most innovative and secure cybersecurity state in the country. We appreciate your partnership and diligence in moving us forward through various initiatives that encourage businesses to use strong cybersecurity frameworks to protect customer data and make Ohio a leader in privacy. Thank you for your time today, and I look forward to the ongoing collaboration to advance cybersecurity in Ohio.
All right. Well, let's get started with that. So thank you very much, sir, for that. Um, and as a reminder, if you do experience any technical difficulties, please email cyber for state leaders at cyber-center.org. Um, at the bottom of your screen as well, we're also creating a space for Q&A at the end of each module. So please feel free to type in questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we'll bring them up during the discussion. Feel, feel free to put them in any time. I won't interrupt us or anything. So to begin this discussion, we're excited to have Chief Information Officer Rogers, Secretary of State LaRose, Senator Sykes, and Representative Carfania to speak on some of the key challenges and opportunities facing Ohio with regards to cybersecurity. After the panel, we'll have some time for some more questions, and then we'll jump into the training. So thank you, panelists, and please take it away. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's doing fantastic. I am honored to be the, the moderator uh, for this dynamic panel. Uh, but before I get, begin this model, the, the, this panel, I, I've got to get everybody in a really, really good mood. Uh, I'm kind of known for doing this, especially at NASIO. Um, I make everyone, you know, feel the, the Ohio love. And so we're going to start with a big old O-H-I-O. That's right. Uh, they, NASIO, National, National Association of State CIOs, they, they really love me for that. Not, not really, but um, I make them say Ohio uh, every chance that I get. They'll be saying that this afternoon at our media conference. Um, so at any rate, I've got a few questions here for some of my uh, who have become really, really good uh, collaborators and, and partners um, as we continue to, to work towards you know, securing uh, the state of Ohio. Um, lots of partnerships, lots of collaboration. Um, so I'm really honored to, to get the chance to uh, ask, ask, ask some questions uh, uh, to some, some of, some, some of the, the key folks here. With regards to um, state state government, what does cybersecurity mean with you? Let's start with you, Secretary LaRose. Well, and Irvin, it's a good thing that you're not the uh, uh, chief information officer for Mississippi. You'd be giving people a heck of a workout up there. <laughs> so what, is it, what does it mean to me? Really two things. As Ohio's Secretary of State and Chief Elections Officer, uh, cybersecurity is, is about two important things. One is continuity of operations. We got to be able to keep doing business, right, at our boards of elections and at the Ohio Secretary of State's office. So continuity of operations, but also voter confidence. And let me explain that one. It's important for people to understand that election systems in Ohio are never connected to the internet. Anything that touches a ballot, whether it's the scanner at the precinct polling location or whether it's the tabulator back at the Board of Elections, all of those are strictly air gapped. They're tested before each election. They're audited after each election. There's tamper evidence seals on them. The only way you can hack a voting machine is to crack it open with a screwdriver and tinker with the innards of it. And of course, the Board of Elections is never gonna let you do that. And so it's important that we protect the systems that the Board of Elections operates on to maintain voter confidence. Because imagine this, if somebody was able to successfully uh, launch a denial of service attack or a defacement attack, attack that would take down the Board of Elections website and replace it with some uh, hacker group uh, you know, manifesto or something, it wouldn't impact voting or the tabulation of votes. But what it would do is cause the public to lose confidence. It also could damage systems such as our voter registration database, which by nature is connected to the internet because of course we offer online voter registration here in the state of Ohio. So we're very vigilant about this. Ohio in many ways is leading the charge. We're the model that other states are trying to follow. DHS has told other states to try to emulate the Ohio model as it relates to election cybersecurity. It's been a top priority for my administration. Great, thank you. Um, same question, uh, Representative Carfania. What does cybersecurity mean to you? Sure. Well, uh, I'd say across the board as elected officials, I mean, we, we have to modernize governmental operations and how we deliver services to the public. Um, you know, and, and I view it as really three components. It's tangible infrastructure, it's our workforce, and it's our processes. And you can't have any single one of those components in a vacuum as it relates to cybersecurity. You got to have coordination. So when it comes to infrastructure, that means you have the network tools and the digital resources handy uh, to, to flag hacking attempts, to uh, activate redundant systems if something gets compromised. Uh, from a workforce aspect, I, I mean, I believe not only do we need to train individuals in computer science so they can ultimately combat cybercrime, but we need to educate everyday Ohioans how to be vigilant against hacking and phishing attempts to steal their personal data. Uh, and then as it relates to processes, you know, kind of along the same lines, we want to make sure that, you know, we have things like strong passwords that People aren't opening questionable attachments or clicking on random hyperlinks or that they aren't handling sensitive data in, um, 
in a haphazard fashion. You know, they're leaving their, their work laptops unattended in their car unlocked or, you know, out in public, you know, when they go get a cup of coffee or that they're storing sensitive data on items that are easy to misplace, such as flash drives. Uh, I, you know, I, you can see I, I took a cybersecurity uh, training webinar in my previous life in the private sector. We took it annually, but, you know, those are the things they tried to draw home. Uh, but so we have to secure our equipment, we have to educate our people, and we need to promote, promote responsible behaviors. So if I could give you a virtual hug, you know, you know, after this pandemic, you know, a virtual high five or, you know, uh, fist bump, it, I would have, it, all the things that you said, man, I, I underlined it and uh, totally and, agree with it. Uh, so I tried to hit you back with the OHIO, I just couldn't unmute fast enough. So I kind of, you know, lost the moment there. It's all good. You're going to hear it again. So you'll give me another chance. <laughs> it was the first test. Um, uh, Senator Sykes, same question. What does cybersecurity mean to you? Well, you know, in this age of information technology, uh, we've got to really protect the data, the, all the state data and the uh, website functionality that we have. You know, we have data and information on uh, all of our citizens and residents of the state. Uh, information like social security numbers, uh, bank account uh, details, uh, and ID information. Uh, we've got to protect the uh, state employee data, all of the information that we have on, on state employees. Uh, we've got to ensure that we have security in the government systems like elections as the Secretary of State has indicated, our state regulatory functions and uh, the information that we provide uh, to and from the federal government. So all of this is, is our responsibility to make sure that we protect it. Great question, great, great, great response. Um, you know, hearing the responses uh, so collaborative across all the various offices that we represent, um, at the end of the day, we're, we're, we are trying to secure and make sure that uh, we're providing the best uh, possible services uh, to our citizens. And so I, it, it just, it's just music to my ears to hear that as the state CIO. Um, I know our state CISO, Anna Palm Sriabastava, would be uh, thrilled to, to hear this as, as well. Uh, with regards to cybersecurity, you know, many of you have touched on it, you know, as far as what, who's the response, whose responsibility is cybersecurity? Um, so that, that question, I just want to throw that out there. Um, and just from your perspective, who's, whose responsibility is it? Um, let's start with uh, Senator Sykes. Well, I think it's, you know, all levels of government have a responsibility to assure that uh, this sensitive data is protected uh, and the public infrastructure is safe and working effectively. You know, the uh, legislature uh, has to make sure that we've got the state of the art uh, uh, equipment and processing information to make sure that there's no failure in the system. Uh, this pandemic, for instance, uh, we had a, a great increase, thousands of more folks applying for unemployment in the state of Ohio. And because our systems weren't up to date, uh, we couldn't reply adequately. Uh, and therefore, uh, many citizens didn't get the funds they needed. And also there was an open door for more fraud. Uh, so we need to update our system. We have a responsibility to do that at all levels to make sure that we protect uh, this, uh, this cyber information. Thank you, Senator Sykes. Uh, Representative Carfagna. Yeah, it, it, it's everyone's responsibility because we all stand to lose regardless of whether we're consciously aware of it. I mean, we have foreign countries that are looking to compromise our defense systems, our intelligence networks, and our economic security. Uh, you know, there's plenty of evidence that foreign countries have been trying to psychologically influence Americans through social media. Uh, you've got terrorists and extremist groups that are targeting our young people, recruiting new members with uh, messages of, of hate and intolerance. And, and that should concern everyone. Uh, you know, we haven't even talked about the cost of identity theft. I mean, everyone pays. Uh, you know, identity fraud alone cost Americans something like you know, $56 billion last year, if I read correctly, uh, around 49 million consumers falling victim. You know, we, we talk about the pandemic and how it changed lives. I mean, it changed the way people shopped and transferred money. So, you know, now they're targeting digital wallet, peer-to-peer uh, -peer payment methods. Uh, you know, you think of the Venmo, Zelle, uh, Apple Pay, uh, 18 million victims uh, fell prey to uh, scams like those last year. Uh, you know, at, at the state level, um, you know, th there's plenty of talk these days about, about equity. I mean, we, we can't guarantee maybe equitable outcomes, 
but we always need to strive to ensure uh, equity of opportunities. And right now we don't have that. Uh, I just got a bill passed, signed in law by the governor last week uh, to, to uh, uh, go after uh, the unserved households that have uh, lack access to uh, residential broadband. Uh, we don't have proper broadband infrastructure in this place and that denies opportunities to 1 million Ohioans that can't access high-speed internet. So, you know, that bill is part of the way, uh, part of a collective effort to, to, to chip away at that, remedy that disparity. Um, you know, let's talk about, uh, I talked earlier about workforce. You know, we want to make sure our, our K-12 students are becoming more proficient in computer science. Uh, I actually had a bill two uh, general assemblies ago, it got signed into law, that allows our uh, high school students to apply computer science classes towards graduation requirements. So they can substitute a computer science class to fulfill one of their units of science, uh, one of the units of math or one of their electives. Uh, but you know, the, the sad truth is that most school districts, and this is amazing, most school districts in Ohio don't teach computer science in high school. Uh, there was at one point a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was something like 63% of our public K-12 school districts had zero, zero offerings of computer science. Uh, and that puts our kids at a severe uh, skill set disadvantage. It makes it more difficult to uh, compete in the global economy. Um, and, and I'm thankful. Uh, I know uh, we have worked on this in the last GA, but we never introduced it. But the, the governor's office, Lieutenant Governor Hughes said, has worked to put policy language in the budget that uh, to try to strategize and accommodate growth in computer science offerings. Uh, that's going to allow for, and also allow for, I guess, uh, more professional development so that we have teachers in place to teach these classes. So it's, it's all of those things, Erwin. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and certainly not last but not least, uh, Senator LaRose, I mean, excuse me, Secretary LaRose. For, formerly Senator, I enjoyed, I enjoyed serving in the state Senate. Uh, listen, it's, uh, it's everyone's responsibility. I'm gonna back up exactly what my colleagues said uh, and reiterate it. It is everyone's responsibility at all levels. Uh, you can have the best uh, cybersecurity standard operating procedures in place. You can have some of the best technology in place to protect your infrastructure. But if you don't have that human firewall, right? If you don't have that human firewall in place, then all of it's worthless. Um, because the, the person clicking and opening the wrong attachment or plugging something into a network it shouldn't be plugged into, or uh, as, uh, as Re Representative Carfagna was saying, leaving uh, a piece of equipment unsecured in an unlocked vehicle. Uh, any, anything like that could, could uh, obviously compromise uh, your security. Uh, that's why when we put out, what, at the beginning of my administration, I launched a 34-point checklist that every board of elections had to follow in order to meet the cybersecurity requirements that we set for the state of Ohio. Again, that's what has become sort of this national model that, that other states are trying to follow. But a, a major component of this was that human firewall. It included background checking and training. And by the way, that training is for the most junior uh, staffer at a board of elections who just started this week, uh, all the way up to myself. And I lead by example. I've gone through those same hours of, of, uh, of cybersecurity training uh, and background checking to make sure uh, that the work that I do doesn't uh, compromise uh, our, our systems here in Ohio. But it also extends to our vendors. Uh, sometimes we overlook those the, the vendors that interact with us, these private sector companies that come in and, and in many cases offer great support, but they have to they have to follow under our security directive uh, the same sets of standards to make sure. Uh, we all know, I think, the story of when a major corporation, Target, was the uh, was the victim uh, of a, a gigantic cybersecurity attack that could have sunk this multi billion dollar company. Uh, it was the result of an HVAC repairman uh, that had uh, allowed. A, a back door to, to be uh, created into their system uh, because they were, you know, remotely controlling air conditioning units. Uh, and so we have to be vigilant about every single aspect of our system. And that includes those vendors that service them. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, that I remember that, uh, that, that story. It was a very creative and clever way to your point, Senator LaRose, how they got into Target. Um, it's amazing how uh, smart uh, the, the criminals they have extra time on their hands, especially during the pandemic, just like we did. So um, I think they've uh, downloaded the app uh, Grammarly and corrected a lot of their, their grammar misspelled uh, words as well to clean up some of those basic emails that you used to say, ah, that looks, uh, looks fake. So as we continue to move on, um, next question, what is the best way to ensure a strong cybersecurity posture for the state of Ohio? Uh, let's start with you, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Sykes. 
Looks like Senator Sykes is frozen. I'm going to. Oh, okay. Okay. Did you call on me? I, I couldn't yeah, hear. Sorry. Oh, okay. I, I think in, in this case, we need uh, real to build a strong bipartisan consensus. This is so important that we reach across the aisle and, you know, so that we can raise the awareness of all citizens of this particular uh, issue. Uh, we need to involve the private sector, particularly the tech uh, companies, uh, to utilize their expertise to help us deal with this issue. We need to raise awareness so that all Ohioans understand what's really at stake. Uh, you know, we had this issue with the Ohio, uh, the pipeline, uh, with, which caused a fuel shortage and increased prices, gasoline prices. Uh, so people need to understand how it affects them and can affect them in their day-to-day -day lives. And that's our responsibility. And that's why I think uh, wholeheartedly, we really need a strong bipartisan consensus. Thank you. Um, let's go with uh, Secretary LaRose. Well, I agree with my colleague, uh, Senator Sykes, that a bipartisan consensus is necessary because something as massive uh, as the work that lies ahead for Ohio to be the most cyber secure state in the nation, and that's my goal, is for Ohio to be the most cyber secure state in the nation, will require that kind of working together uh, that, that brings that kind of thing uh, to, to pass. Um, but for me, it's been a, a three point uh, kind of guideline. This is what we had in mind when we were putting together our cybersecurity checklist, that 34 uh, point list that we required our boards of elections to follow. It's people, it's technology, and it's physical security. And I put people first. That alludes to the previous discussion. Uh, but if you don't have your people trained and, and, and understanding of what their responsibilities are, uh, then, then all is lost. Uh, technology, um, you know, we have to invest in the latest, most cutting edge technology. We've done that at our boards of elections by requiring an Albert intrusion sensor, which is virtually a, a cyber uh, a burglar alarm, if you will, uh, at every one of our 88 county board of elections. They seem uh, a monitor to, 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 to be able to go back and track uh, what went wrong when something does go wrong so that we can uh, uh, figure out where the problem was. And, and also making sure that we've updated our, our systems with the, with the latest, uh, uh, the, the, the latest uh, uh, security patches and, and that kind of thing, which is obviously an ongoing uh, priority of ours. And then physical security. Listen, if you do all of those last two things that I just mentioned, and then you leave the room uh, where your servers are unlocked overnight, uh, then it, then you know what's the point? And so you got to have the physical security as well. Those are the three things that were our guiding principle for our security checklist. And by the way, it's not a once sort of point in time thing. It is an ongoing matter. That's why, for example, at our office, we hired a uh, Chief Information Security Officer. We were the first Secretary of State in the country to hire a CISO, and we have a full-time cybersecurity team that fans out across the state to assist our county boards of elections because, as we know, county boards of elections reflect the great diversity of Ohio. We've got county boards that are two people that work at the courthouse basement, and then we've got county boards with a full staff of like 100 uh, and their own full-time uh, you know, cybersecurity and, and CIO. Uh, and so it, everything in between. So we need to make sure that at that local level that they have the support that they need. And that's something that our office is providing them. So uh, Sen uh, <clears throat> Secretary uh, LaRose, I, I just want to give you a huge shout out. You know, at NASIO, um, I have the opportunity of being on the executive board. Um, and you're right, you're, uh, you're the, the 32 point, uh, 34 point uh, checklist is something that folks are trying to model. Um, and that's why I think it's a, you know, great, great for the state of Ohio uh, to be, a, be an example. So kudos to you all. I know that we partner with uh, you all through um, my uh, state uh, CISO, uh, working with your team, uh, making sure that we were uh, providing the background support. Um, so thank you for that collaboration. Last but not least, uh, we're going to give you an opportunity, uh, Representative Carfania, to answer this the same question, and then I'm going to open it up to see there's a couple of questions in the queue. Sure. Well, I mean, just like the others have said, I mean, we have to embrace technology uh, in terms of, of government. Uh, you know, try to get out ahead of things. Uh, you know, I can't expect uh, policymakers to be early adopters. I mean, government moves at a glacial pace when it comes to technology. Uh, one of the things that we actually did here in the Ohio House, just as General Assembly for the first time, was we actually created a standing committee uh, uh, to focus on these issues. It's, it's the House Technology and Innovation Committee, uh, because we wanted to try to give these, these policy matters the focus and the deliberation that they deserve. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working on a particular bill uh, uh, handling blockchain, House Bill 177. It gives uh, blanket permissive authority to uh, our public sector in Ohio. 
uh, to let them utilize blockchain and all the protections and the transparency that it offers uh, in the course of their operations. You know, a, a lot of our, uh, our communities and our governmental agencies and entities, they're creatures of statutes. So anytime they want to do something innovative, they have to go and they have to ask the General Assembly to give them permission to hire vice code to let them do these things. It, it sounds ridiculous, but you know, that's the way the law works. So rather than just do a piecemeal, let's just give blanket permissive authority. Let's enable the marketplace for uh, all these types of applications. I mean, you think of uh, protecting or, or, or applying uh, blockchain to, to things like voter data, medical records, smart contracts, benefit transfers, uh, title transfers, education verification. I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, Brian Baldridge, uh, has uh, just come out with the Ohio Computer Crimes Act. Uh, again, re, uh, uh, reintroduced that. That's House Bill 116. That recognizes new categories of cybercrime and extends a, a variety of stricter charges for, for prosecutors to, to pursue. You know, so it, it comes with just, you know, evolving again, uh, as, as criminals get more creative and innovative, we, we have to keep pace with that. Uh, I'm actually working with the Lieutenant Governor and the Office of Innovate Ohio on a forthcoming piece of legislation. It'll be the, the Ohio Privacy Protection Act. And that's going to establish uh, statutory protections for Ohioans' personal information uh, when it's used by companies that are doing business here in Ohio. Uh, we believe that, that consumers, they have a right to know the personal data that's being collected. They have a right to request uh, access to and disclosure of that data that's collected. They have the right to request a business delete the personal data collected on them that's being used for commercial purposes. And uh, they have the right to request that businesses not sell their personal data to third parties. Uh, so we're working closely with the administration, uh, with the state's business and technology community, and uh, the attorney general's office. Uh, so I'd say stay tuned on that. And I guess one more just last, last point I'd, I'd make is that, you know, we need to look at the shifting economic trends resulting from this pandemic. And I guess I'm maybe shifting a little bit away from cybersecurity, but still staying in technology. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of takeaways in this very specific, at least to where I represent here in central Ohio. I mean, we can expect to see an influence or excuse me, an increase in fulfillment centers with the surge in online shopping. Uh, we're going to see a shift in the supply chain. More items are going to be made in the U.S. where manufacturers can be closer to businesses. And then we're going to continue to see a surge in data centers here in central Ohio. Uh, as work from home becomes uh, much more the norm and that necessitates cloud-based services. You know, I say all that because Ohio has more than 120 data centers. There's 50 of them in central Ohio alone. That's billions of dollars of investment. We are ideally suited, our state is, for data centers with little risk of earthquakes, hurricanes, flooding, tornadoes. Uh, we have ample uh, sources of low-cost electricity, a mild climate, keeping energy costs low, and we have tech sally tech savvy talent that's needed to run these types of data centers. Uh, so I just kind of want to put in a plug for that. Uh, you know, as we see again, the shift towards online shopping and, and more cloud-based services, we are uniquely positioned to capitalize on that. And I think we have to recognize that and, and bolster it. Awesome. Um, again, it, it, all, it all starts with collaboration. And I think that's been the kind of the reoccurring theme here. Uh, across the aisle, uh, across uh, separately elected offices, you know, it, it, it's going to take us uniting because the bad guys are doing that same thing. So I've got a couple of questions in the queue. So Senator, uh, excuse me, um, Secretary LaRose, um, I want to tee you up here. Um, you mentioned the 34 point checklist. The question is, is that, is that available on your website? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, I would encourage you all to, to plagiarize any of our stuff that, that you can. And, 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 and that's the, the great thing. Uh, public sector is that when a good idea uh, emerges from one office, uh, you can take it to other offices within state government, uh, but also to other states. And, and I can't tell you how many times I've gotten calls from other secretaries of state around the country saying, hey, can you send me that checklist that you guys are working on? Uh, and so that's something that we can make available. If you're looking for it, uh, just email me, frank at ohiosos.gov. Uh, that's my email, frank at ohiosos.gov, and we'll get you a copy of it. It's also available on our website, but you have to do some digging to find it. Uh, there's a couple other things, by the way, that have been sort of part of our playbook. I mean, there are a few things where Ohio has been the first in the nation to do this in the last couple of years. Uh, we were the first Secretary of State's office, as I told you, to have a CISO. CISO is very different from CIO. You know this, Irvin, but the, the CISO uh, is a person who wakes up every morning focused on, 
on that uh, security aspect uh, of your cyber infrastructure. I highly recommend it. Uh, again, uh, having your CIO try to wear both hats is, is really uh, not ideal. Uh, you want to have a separate CISO, and we have that now at the Ohio Secretary of State's office. Uh, we were uh, the first state uh, in the nation to put out a very easy to follow 34 point checklist, as I told you. And the idea is that just put it in writing. Uh, when I came to this office, we found that there were a lot of studies that have been done about what should get accomplished. And there were a lot of vulnerability studies that, that have been conducted and all of that. I said, it's time for action. We need to start putting these ideas into action. So that's why we took all of those recommendations from the experts and said, thou shalt do these 34 things to protect your cyber infrastructure. And again, it's not a one and done kind of thing. It's like lather, rinse, repeat, right? We do it over and over again to make sure that we're always uh, in compliance with that 34 point checklist. And then something else that we did that I would encourage you to take a look at is that we were additionally the first state in the nation, uh, the first secretary of state in the country to have a vulnerability disclosure uh, agreement. Now, what this means is I asked hackers to hack us. Let me explain that though, because the bad guys are already going to do what they want to do. The bad guys are going to do their thing. And we know that. And we know that uh, here in Ohio uh, and really any government system is sort of constantly under attack or so constantly being probed uh, by, by malicious actors. Uh, but there are also a lot of good guys and gals out there that have a lot of experience. And the, the way that they establish, establish their credibility and their bona fides is by, is by being uh, that white hat hacker or the good guy hacker or ethical hacker. They go by a bunch of different names. Security researchers uh, is, is a new one that they go by. But they, they want to be able to be the one that found that vulnerability. We want them to find that vulnerability. I would have to spend uh, millions and millions of dollars to get the kind of expertise that we've been able to get effectively for free by asking people to take a look at what we've got. And again, it, it's to, to go back to my military background, if there's a hole in my fence, I want to know about it, right? Because bad news doesn't get better with time. And so if you scroll to the bottom of my website, ohiosos.gov, you will see at the bottom there a little thing that says vulnerability disclosure uh, agreement. And if you click on it, and if it said what it says effectively, and it's written in, in you know legal language, of course, but it says that if you find a vulnerability, uh, as long as you don't break anything or disclose uh, you know sensitive information or deface our website, as long as you don't do any damage, tell us about it. We're not going to prosecute you. In fact, we'll give you an award. We'll give you a gold star. And as a result of that, we've been able to make our infrastructure even more secure. Other states, uh, secretaries of state, are now following that example as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so um, because uh, I, I agree with you with regards to uh, the CIO and the, the CISO shouldn't shouldn't be in the same position. Um, I actually lived that life uh, for six months uh, when I was at the attorney general's office as we were searching for a chief information security officer. Uh, for those that uh, don't understand that acronym. Um, and it was like playing Jack Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, but however, it gave me a great appreciation for cybersecurity on the importance to begin and end with that. Um, so I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to um, the Secretary of State uh, CISO, CISO uh, Mr. Sean McAfee, uh, who works in conjunction with our state Chief Information Security Officer, Anna Palm Street of Bastava. Um, they have a monthly um, group that, that are, that's pulled together every month and they're sharing uh, information back and forth between the separately elected offices because uh, each separately elected office has a has a has a CISO, and they're tapped into the state uh, CISO on a Palm Street of office in order to make sure that we're we're doing cross contaminate cross uh, collaboration, uh, including with a with the uh, National Guard. Uh, there's one last question in the queue here, and that is why have we not adopted an, a flexible and national cybersecurity risk management standard? such as NIST uh, risk management framework. And here's what I'll tell you. Uh, we actually have, um, uh, we use NIST 8, 853 as a part of Cyber Ohio, um, that's, which is part of the um, uh, Innovate Ohio um, uh, initiative led by our Lieutenant Governor John Husted. That is the baseline of every uh, you know, decision as far as policy wise. Um, we, we get audited so much uh, from all the various regula regulatory requirements, such as CGIS, which is the uh, uh, from a, a law enforcement criminal justice information systems, uh, we get uh, IRS 1075, uh, which is the from a, from a federal uh, Fed perspective. Uh, we have uh, I'm drawing blanks here, but there are a number 
uh, of them. And, and everything begins with uh, that framework um, because if, if you do, if you leverage that, that framework, it's checks and balances to make sure that you are given the appropriate um, uh, responsibilities to the appropriate folks. And you have checkers that can come in and verify that. So I'm sure that our national cybersecurity uh, center team uh, with a lovely background um, uh, will, will, would back me up on that. Um, uh, it, it's very, very important um, that, that, you, that you lean into that. Um, and if you do, I think you will pass many of the, the audits that will, will ultimately effectively take place. Um, I'm looking here, looking here. Um, Representative uh, Carfania, um, I passed it over to you. Um, and then uh, if there are other questions that you guys have uh, from our attendees, please pop them into the chat. We'd be more than happy to, to get those answered, whether you want Secretary uh, LaRose to answer that, Senator Sykes, or Representative Carfania or uh, Irvin Rogers, State CIO. So with that, uh, Representative Carfania, I believe that you wanted to. Uh... No, I, I'm, no I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I read that wrong. My, my, my apologies. <laughs> are, are there other questions in the queue uh, that folks have? I know that we're running short on time. Uh, so gonna, if not, there's one, one, one last question here. And that last question is, uh, is a round table for everybody. Uh, and it's basically, what is your desired outcome of today's training and partnership with the National Cybersecurity Center uh, for your fellow colleagues uh, that are in attendance today? Uh, let's start with uh, Secretary LaRose. Bottom line, Ohio needs to be the best in the nation. Uh, that's something that, that, that we like as, as Buckeyes. We like to, to lead the way and, and be the best. Uh, and we need to be the most cyber secure state in the nation. That's my goal. Uh, that's the goal that I've had for our team. Uh, some of the, the military wisdom that I bring to, to things, uh, I think maybe sometimes my team gets, gets tired of my Army one-liners, but I, I always told them the bad guys only have to be right once. We have to be right every day. That's a, that's a saying that we have. The bad guys only have to be right once, but we, the good guys and gals, have to be right every single day. And that's the kind of vigilance uh, that, that we bring to the table. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned my, my CISO. Uh, and, uh, and Sean McAfee is the best in the business uh, in a lot of ways. We recruited him out of the federal government to come back home to Ohio, and we're proud of him. Spencer Wood, uh, my CIO, uh, is, uh, is one of the best in the business and just awesome uh, and a great part of our team. Uh, but uh, again, that extends down to every one of our 88 counties and having that technical point of contact at each one of our 88 county boards of elections. Um, Irvin, something that we didn't talk about yet is another area where Ohio has really led the charge and that is the creation of the Ohio Cyber Reserve. This was a bill uh, that I worked on during my time in the legislature. We got it done. Uh, and uh, I've been able to now help uh, bring it to fruition by working with the Ohio National Guard. We were the first state in the nation to stand up a cyber reserve. And what that be means basically is that we've got a response force that's part of the Ohio National Guard. And it is growing as we speak. They're recruiting more and building more teams. Uh, these are folks that, that are you know, our friends and neighbors. They work at the local utility company or the local bank, or they work in some aspect of private life, but when needed, just like our guard would for our Ohio National Guard would for a natural disaster or a riot or whatever else, when needed, we can activate the cyber reserve, which is the best in the, you know, the, the, the best minds in the state and put them in a van if we need to and send them to where the problem is occurring. Uh, and, and what that's meant to do is focus on, again, that continuity of operations. Of course, you know, federal law enforcement, they want to come in and sort of do the crime scene thing and figure out who done it, which is cool. We want to be able to go after bad guys. But what the Cyber Reserve is there to do is get essential systems back up and running again as soon as possible. And again, whether that's state government, local government, county government, um, or critical infrastructure partners. Ohio was the first in the nation to do this, and this is something that we should be proud of. And so if you ever, God forbid, find yourself in, in that scenario where you are dealing with something bigger than what you can deal with at your agency or at your uh, local entity, don't hesitate to ring the bell. Call in the Ohio Cyber Reserve, and they'll come running uh, and bring some great expertise with them. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Secretary LaRose. Uh, Representative Carfania? Uh, really, all I would say is that, you know, We've got to get real. We've got to take a very nuanced approach to technology as policymakers. And we got to do it probably in the same fashion that we try to do for education or Medicaid or taxes. You know, this is not just some something gimmicky or nuanced. I mean, or rather, I mean, it's, it's something that we have to take just as seriously as we do these bread and butter issues. Uh, we've got to be strategic about it. We've got to be patient. Uh, we don't want to just legislate haphazardly or get, get caught up in the moment because it's the issue du jour. Uh, or just 
you know, to, to, to make it look like we're, we're a peer forward thinking, uh, you know, I always say that we're experts on nothing and we're generalists on everything. You know, we, we have to know just enough to be conversational about things. Uh, so, you know, we, we've got to have not just a political will to enable innovation, but we've got to be willing to solicit the help and the guidance of those people that work in this space. There's a lot of amazing technology that has uh, thrived over the past few decades uh, because government has not run any interference. Uh, so I would encourage everybody on this call, uh, get to know your legislators, your, your, your state senator, your state rep, um, you know, ask us out for a cup of coffee or, you know, find a way, you know, to, to, to meet us in public. Um, you know, we're, we're not scary people. You know, we, we want to embrace these things. We want to get to, uh, to, to know what's important uh, in your field. Uh, you know, we see how I, I talked about earlier, we see how criminals are embracing technology. Uh, and we have to evolve the times from data breaches uh, to online human trafficking, uh, using social media to manipulate human behaviors. Uh, I'm, I'm 44 years old. I, I, I don't think I'm that old. Uh, I was a senior back in high school in the mid 90s and I took personal typing on a typewriter. I was thinking about, about this just the other day. Yeah, uh, you know, the internet back then was just really kind of an educational tool that you used at the library. Uh, my teenage daughter knows more about how to navigate technology at age 15 uh, than I have at 44 years on this earth. So it's, it's incredible how quickly things are moving. It's scary as a parent. Uh, but, you know, as a legislator, we want to try to do right. Uh, we've got to embrace innovation and technology, and we need all of your help to do it because we don't know what we don't know. Thank you, Representative. Um, really, really appreciate your partnership, um, especially on many of the uh, fronts that we're working on cross collaborator you know, uh, from a collaboration standpoint. Last that. word, uh, Senator Sykes. Well, I don't have much to add. My colleagues have uh, exhausted the list, but uh, this is my first uh, cyber uh, activity event. I'm very appreciative to be involved in this and to find out what we're doing and what the problems and issues are. Uh, the leaders in this state, uh, the Secretary of State and what he's doing here in Ohio, as well as the uh, Lieutenant Governor, what they're doing. I think it's important that we build this knowledge base uh, within the state at all levels of government. And we just can't wait until we have another crisis uh, to understand. We need to communicate so that people can appreciate what we need to do to be proactive. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Representative Carfagna. Thank you, Senator LaRose. Thank you, Senator Sykes. It has been my honor and my privilege uh, to moderate this panel. Um, I look forward to continue to working with you all. Uh, and uh, uh, a special shout out to, uh, to all of the men and women, uh, IT Avengers that are out there keeping the state safe uh, from, uh, from the bad guys. Back to you. Thank you panelists for that great discussion. And thank you so much for the good questions too. That was um, just a really, really robust conversation and raised so many good um, points. Ohio really is leading the way. So thank you all for your work on that too. Mm -hmm. The discussion did raise a critical point. And as we work from broad cybersecurity issues at the state level to your personal security, we want to emphasize that the varying levels of complexity involved in securing enterprises are vast. Personal security can feel very complex, which is why we're excited to share the resources that we will today. But the time, resources, and strategy required to protect entire state and local enterprises, as you've just heard, is incredibly challenging. Basically, while the steps we will walk through later on will make you personally much safer, the steps to make state enterprises secure are far more costly and intensive, and your role as a state legislator is critical in supporting those efforts. And with that, the next module is going to tackle what a lot of the standard cyber attacks are and why they succeed. Then we'll jump into how you can defend yourself against those types of attacks. So, and with that, we're going to talk about cyber attacks and why they work, just like Maddie said. So we're going to define different types of attacks and how they can work. We want to show this as a baseline before getting into any of the best practices, because it's easier to implement practices when we know why we are doing it. And as a quick reminder, um, at the end of the session, we'll do a short Q&A, uh, so be sure to put more questions in there. Um, if anybody's around, we'll definitely have some awesome people to answer some of those questions, and we'll get to those later. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, the first attack we are going to cover is phishing. This is a huge one. You heard it mentioned in the panel discussion. Phishing attempts are everywhere, and attackers have gotten incredibly advanced, studying our behaviors and fine-tuning their approaches to exploit our vulnerabilities. 
In order to better prepare ourselves against this type of attack, we need to understand really what it is and ultimately why it works. So Forrest, go ahead and take it away. Imagine checking your email and receiving an alarming message about one of your online accounts. The email says that your account has been compromised and it provides a link to enter your private information. The email sounds and looks legitimate, but it wasn't real. Instead, it was sent by cyber criminals looking to fish you. Phishing and spear phishing are some of the most prevalent cyber scams because they work. Phishing is when scammers send out mass emails hoping to trick people into divulging personal and financial information by pretending to be a legitimate source like a bank, a trusted retailer, or a delivery service. Phishing scammers often ask the user to reset passwords in an attempt to steal information. And unlike random phishing scams, spear phishing, just like it sounds, is highly targeted and points directly at you. Spear phishing scammers might even use social media or other public information to find out personal details. Then, they use this information to craft fake emails that sound believable and real. This type of scam is one of the most popular methods used against people of influence, just like you. If you fall for a campaign like this, you may end up downloading malicious software or malware that can infect your device. Alternatively, criminals sometimes install a type of malware called ransomware, which is designed to block access to a device until a sum of money, often in cryptocurrency, is paid. Once criminals have control over your device, they can change your passwords, steal your money, and even your identity. The good news is that there are ways to help prevent phishing emails from impacting you. Knowing what they look like is the first step. No legitimate bank, government agency, or business will send you an email requesting that you re-enter your private information. Misspellings, poor grammar, and typos are also clues to watch for. If you receive a phishing email, the best thing to do is stop. Don't click anything in the email or share it. Contact IT support. Stay vigilant, take a breath, and think before you click. Forrest, thank you so much for that. One of the things criminals and bad actors are trying to get through phishing or spear phishing attacks are your passwords. If a criminal doesn't get your password through a phishing attempt, they might try other ways. So we have Thomas Russell, our cyber education manager, to share more about that. Did you know the average person has 27 online accounts? And each of those accounts requires picking a username and a password. I'm sure you all have heard of the advice to pick complicated passwords, but many of us still choose the ones that are easy to remember. On top of that, a lot of us use the same passwords for all of our online accounts, which only increases the chances of being compromised. Part of the reason we may not get too creative when it comes to passwords is because we might assume it takes a lot of work to hack millions and millions of passwords, and so ours is likely safe but it's not as hard as you might think. There are a few ways hackers work to get your password. Brute force is the simplest, but can also take the longest time. Hackers simply try every combination of words and symbols they can. To make brute force attacks easier, hackers might use a tactic called a dictionary attack. A dictionary attack uses software to try to guess the passwords by randomly cycling through different combination of words, symbols, and numbers. Some dictionary attack software can work through millions of combinations per second. Be careful answering public survey questions on social media about where you went to high school, what year you graduated, and what city you're from. Criminals can use these hints to try and break your password. Another popular method hackers use to get our passwords is through phishing attacks or sending fake emails trying to impersonate legit businesses in an attempt to get your credentials. Start with using a password manager. These require you to remember only one complicated password to access your personal password vault. For all your other accounts, the password manager generates complicated random passwords. If you don't use a password manager, try using phrases instead of single words. And whatever you do, 
Don't write your password on a sticky note and leave it on your monitor or on your desk where someone else can see it. Remember, your password is the first line of defense to protect your online information and a starting point for all good cybersecurity. Thomas, thanks again for such an incredibly helpful walkthrough. And, you know, it's interesting to talk about passwords because passwords are such a critical part of all of our security. It's actually one of the most significant vulnerabilities we have, too, because we create so many passwords and accounts. Um, but the next thing we'll talk about is a slightly less known attack that can compromise your security, something called SIM swapping. This attack is more likely to be used against, well, people like yourselves, unfortunately. So, Maddie. SIM card is a small plastic chip in your phone that tells your device which cellular network to connect to and which phone number to use. Most of us don't think twice about our SIM cards, except maybe when we get a new phone. But we should. SIM swapping is a cybercrime that occurs when someone contacts your wireless carrier and manages to convince the call center employee that they are you. Cyber criminals do this by using information from previous hacks, data breaches, or something you publicly shared on social networks. Then they trick the call center employee into switching the SIM card link to your phone number and replace it with a SIM card in their possession. In some cases, SIM numbers are changed directly by telecom company employees bribed by criminals. Once your phone number is assigned to a new card, all of your incoming calls and text messages are routed to whatever device the new SIM card is assigned to. This makes it easy for a bad actor to access your online accounts because they can use two-factor authentication against you because they are now the ones that account security information is sent to. The devastating results could be anything from selling your social media accounts to stealing your identity. So how do you protect yourself? First of all, contact your network provider and select a PIN that anyone calling to make changes will need to know. Secondly, use better two-factor authentication, such as the Google Authenticator app, rather than short message service, aka text. The Authenticator app links to your phone rather than your phone number, meaning that a hacker would need to get a hold of the actual device in your hand. The next time you pick up your phone, just remember there is more than one way to hack your accounts and it could come directly from your number. Stay vigilant. A little extra caution could make all the difference. Well, great job, Maddie. But similar to SIM swapping, another vulnerability that we might not think too much about is what can happen if your device itself is stolen. Mm -hmm. um, Representative Carfagna mentioned it earlier, but as legislators, you may be an even greater target to this type of an attack as well. And here to talk through some more about that is security expert Maurice Turner. Hi, my name is Maurice Turner. I'm an election security expert. I'm here to talk to you today about the threats that you might face at the intersection of physical security and cybersecurity. The challenge with physical security is that sometimes those cybersecurity protection measures you have in place can be bypassed if an intruder has physical access to your device or systems. I'll start off with a couple of tips that might be helpful to you. First, consider using a second factor of authentication, like a security key. It works together with your strong password in case that strong password is stolen or somehow compromised through a data breach. Secondly, consider having an automatic lock on your devices. This can be as short as five minutes. So that way, if an employee steps away from a device, the system automatically locks without the employee having to do anything. Lastly, many mobile devices have built-in remote wiping or remote tracking features. These can be activated if a device is lost or stolen and turn that device into a digital paperweight. To help put this into practice, here are a couple of scenarios that can get you planning in the right direction. The first scenario, what would happen if you needed to evacuate your building and be out of your office within 60 seconds? What devices couldn't you quickly lock down? And what devices would remain open and unlocked for an intruder to potentially have access to? A second scenario to consider is, 
What would happen if an employee called you to say that their device had been stolen from their home office overnight? How would you be able to restrict access to the data that's on that device or to help prevent that employee from being impersonated online? These are just a couple of things to consider at the intersection of physical security and cybersecurity. And as always, practice makes perfect. It's just like buckling up when you get into a car. At first you had to learn it and someone had to show you, but now it's just second nature. So hopefully security will be second nature to you as well. Thank you for your time and especially thank you for your efforts in keeping yourself and our community safe. Maurice mentioned that there are tools to shut down access to your device. For more details on this topic, we suggest you take a look at the one pager and the supplementary materials and associated links to the type of device you have to dive deeper into how to protect it if it's stolen. So in the close out of this section, we're going to switch gears to an even less tangible threat, but one that now takes place in our world daily, that of misinformation and disinformation. For this discussion, we have the NCC's Chief Strategy Officer and resident cybersecurity expert Mark Weatherford to share some insights. Hello, my name is Mark Weatherford and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at the National Cybersecurity Center. I previously served as the first Deputy Undersecretary for Cybersecurity at the Department of Homeland Security in the Obama Administration and was the first Chief Information Security Officer in the state of California in the Schwarzenegger Administration. I also served as Colorado's first Chief Information Security Officer under both Governor Bill Owens and Governor Bill Ritter. The challenges of misinformation and disinformation are everywhere today. And while the recent Russian misinformation campaigns to distract American voters and the ongoing fake news about COVID-19 are front and center, they're only the most visible. History is rife with fake news. Everything from Sasquatch to the Flat Earth Society and aliens from Mars to the Pigman. Someone is always out there looking for new ways to exploit those people willing to listen. You may remember the Twitter incident in 2013 when hackers compromised the Associated Press Twitter account and tweeted that there had been explosions at the White House. This was a legitimate source, so most people, for a very short time, assumed the information was factual. The stock market even took a quick but dramatic dip following that tweet. I recently read a story about a sign taped to an elevator in an apartment building informing people that using the elevator would soon cost $35 a month. The tenants were outraged and launched a social media attack on the building manager, only to find out that it was a prank. Unfortunately, the damage was done and cleaning up the mess took far longer than starting it. A quote attributed to Mark Twain goes, a lie can travel around the globe while the truth is still putting on its shoes. With the vast reach of social media today, that quote should be amended to say, a lie can travel to the moon and back while the truth is still sleeping. Misinformation is simply false information, while disinformation is the intentional spreading of that misinformation. While the strict definitions are slightly different, disinformation is a challenge today because social media has created vast opportunities for sharing information that simply didn't exist just 10 or 20 years ago. Combating disinformation is a challenge, make no bones about it. But there are a few things we can all do, and they involve critically thinking about and evaluating information before sharing it. It's an unfortunate sign of the times that we should all be a little paranoid about what we read online today. Here are eight things to critically evaluate before reacting to social media clickbait. One, can you readily identify the source of the information, and is the source credible? Sometimes it's difficult to determine, but if it sounds sketchy, it probably is. Two, are there multiple sources providing the same information, or is it just one lone enlightened source? That's a red flag. Three, does it evoke a strong emotional response? Memes have become notorious for generating quick emotional responses because it's so simple to just repost or retweet a meme without even thinking about it. Four, does it sound absurd on its surface? Again, sketchy probably is. Five, check the dates. Stories and pictures often resurface years after originally posted, usually with just a new twist on the message. Six, is it time sensitive or is it gonna cost you something? These are always red flags. 
Seven, does it appear to be just satire or is someone just trolling for fun? Eight, does it leave you with questions like something seems missing here or these facts don't add up to a complete story? If so, maybe dig a little deeper before becoming another victim in the threat of disinformation. Disinformation and fake news are tearing at the fabric of our national and even global society, pitting family members against family members, friends against friends, and political parties against political parties. All of us need to be consciously aware of how we're consuming information, and more importantly, how we're sharing and spreading information to ensure we aren't contributing to the problem. With some simple critical thinking, we can all be part of the solution. Okay, that was a ton of information. And now I can feel, uh, imagine that we're all feeling a tad bit nervous about how we can protect ourselves against all of this. But the great thing is, is that if you incorporate the next module's habits into your daily life, you will significantly reduce your risk of any of these attacks being successful against you. And again, that's crucial because the safer you are, then the safer your colleagues and constituents are. But because that was so much info, Please be sure to answer any questions that you have and put them down in the Q&A section so we can answer them at the end. And with that, Maddie, do you want to introduce the next module? Yeah, sounds good. All right, so we've covered why cybersecurity matters, what types of attacks you may see, and now we're going to tackle the most important part, how you can protect yourself and not get duped. There is a lot of material in this section as well, so if you have a tough time taking notes, know that there are one-pagers available to highlight the main tips on our site. So in the way that we've approached this is we've broken down the top tips for practicing excellent cyber hygiene into a hopefully easy to remember acronym that Kevin Minacci has been generous to break down for us. Kevin? Hi, my name is Kevin Bonacci, and I lead the cybersecurity practice at Targeted Victory. I'm the former Chief External Affairs Officer at CISA, the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency at the Department of Homeland Security. Now at CISA, one of our main goals was working to improve American cybersecurity. And we did that in part with efforts to raise the cyber awareness baseline for the nation. Now, to me, it's pretty simple. If you have a cell phone, a laptop, a tablet, or any smart device, really, cybersecurity should be important to you. Why? Because hackers are out there trying to scam identities, steal data, or cripple companies like the country saw recently when the Colonial Pipeline was shut down for millions because of a ransomware attack. Now, we're all vulnerable to cyber attacks, especially if you work in a critical position, like being an elected official, a state leader, or part of the important staff that work for them. Personal accountability is important when it comes to cyber, and everybody should be following the best practices laid out by the National Cybersecurity Center's duped. So what does that mean? Well, D, deploy MFA, multi-factor authentication. Make sure you have that extra layer of security on your favorite app. You, update your software regularly. Now, when you get those little notifications on your phone about a software update, make sure you actually go ahead and do it. There are often important patches for bugs that ensure your favorite app is secure. P, I hope you aren't using Hello123 to log into your favorite app anymore. So make sure you have strong passwords, change them regularly, and don't use the same one for all your apps. E, encrypt and back up your work. Now, you wouldn't give your social security number to a criminal on a piece of paper, so don't send emails with important files and important personal data on them over the internet without encrypting them. Lastly, D, don't click on things you shouldn't. Now, I think this is probably the most important one. If a link looks fishy or you don't know where it's from or it came in from a random text, don't click on it. Now, there are a lot of ways you can all do your part. So go to cyberforstateleaders.org, take the trainings, and make sure you're doing your, your part to protect yourself and your company and organization from cyber threats. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. We couldn't have said it better. Now let's get into the details. To start with deploying multi-factor authentication, we are pleased to have Lucian Tio, the Google's, um, Google's online global safety lead to help clarify what multi-factor authentication is and how we can and should be using it. Hi, I'm Lucian Thiel, 
online safety lead at Google. Most of us are used to logging into our various devices and online accounts using a single factor of authentication, like a password. At this point, you would have learned how to create strong passwords, and you'd also know that you should be using unique passwords for every account you have. But given the growing sophistication of cyber threats, especially those aimed at sensitive information held by state legislators and government employees, you might want to consider using more than one type of authentication or what's called multi-factor authentication. Enabling multi-factor authentication is like adding a pin-activated security system on top of your normal lock you already have on your front door. Multi-factor authentication incorporates different pieces of information like something you know, something you have, and even something you are. Something you know is the most common type of authentication. Passwords, passphrases, pin numbers, secret questions, and smartphone swipe patterns all fall into this category. These types of authentication are great, but adding at least one other form of protection is critical for good cybersecurity. Something you have is another type of authentication that requires a piece of physical hardware. This could be a USB key, a smart card, or a random code generated on a dongle. Codes sent to your phone via SMS would also fall into this category, though SMS authentication can fail if you should become a victim of SIM swapping. A better alternative for something you have would be an authenticator app such as Google Authenticator, which requires you to have your physical phone in your possession. You could also use personal biometrics such as fingerprint scans, facial recognition, iris scan, or even a voice print as a form of authentication. These types of authentication are more difficult to compromise. Most online accounts offer steps for at least two-factor authentication and keep an eye out for the common question of would you like to use multi-factor authentication or would you like to enable two-factor authentication when you sign in or create an account. Your IT department can also help guide you to these options. Though any of your accounts that contain personal information should be protected, it is important to be extra vigilant with your email, social media, and financial accounts, as they are some of the most commonly targeted by cyber criminals and can be especially damaging for civic leaders and state legislators. Besides the obvious theft of information and finances, bad actors can use your accounts to pose as you and deploy harmful and inaccurate news and information. For additional information about setting up multi-factor authentication, contact the specific software or account you're trying to protect. But ultimately, setting up multi-factor authentication is relatively simple and significantly more effective than a simple username and password. And trust me, the extra steps you take to deploy multi-factor authentication on your accounts, especially in addition to the rest of the Duke practices, will make you safer. Great explanation, Lucian, and thanks again for walking us through that. So the next piece we wanna talk about is software updates, why they matter and how you do them. Um, the biggest thing for this one is that software updates are particularly useful in protecting against malware attacks. And here to share with us more on what to do is Ethan Chumley, Senior Cybersecurity Strategist for Microsoft's Defending Democracy Program. Ethan, take it away. I'm Ethan Chumley with Microsoft's Cybersecurity and Democracy team, and I'm here today to talk to you a bit about hygiene. And no, I don't mean the flossing or the scrubbing kind that are part of your daily routine. I'm referring to cyber hygiene, a critical part of keeping your computer system secure. If you're not sure what hygiene looks like, just think of those little pop-up windows that ask you to install the latest operating system version, the latest app update, or that next patch. And I know, just like you, waiting to install those updates during an already busy day can seem tedious, but this is a key practice to maintaining good security. Getting in the habit of downloading and installing the latest software updates is an easy way to keep yourself, your networks, and your computer safe from a security incident. Why? 
because when bugs or vulnerabilities are found in software, they're typically fixed quickly by the software vendors, but it is then dependent on you to install those latest updates when prompted. Just like flossing, updating your systems is a routine preventative action that can keep intruders out and keep your data safe. Not to mention, it's a lot cheaper to be preventative than to clean up after the fact. We encourage regular updates across all of your devices, from the apps on your phone to the software on your laptops, even the smart fridge and Wi-Fi connected thermostats you may have in your home. Of course, your IT departments need to update shared servers and websites and backend systems too. Patching and restarting those shared servers might cause some downtime and feel inconvenient, but well-communicated maintenance windows during off-peak hours are essential to good security across all IT-owned systems. Your security needs are ongoing and they're constantly evolving. There are bad guys out there hoping that you don't apply the latest patches and updates because you'll just be making their jobs easier. Many of the hacks we hear about these days were avoidable as they relied on victims' computers running old and out-of-date software, often a result of ignoring patches and delaying major software updates for weeks, months, or even years. If you're watching this video, that means you're a leader in your community. This means you are in a position to contribute to a culture of security. And as a leader, you're in the position to help your organization align to security best practices. This might mean allocating funds or asking your IT teams about how they're managing updates responsibly. And finally, it means you're in the position to encourage the community, businesses, nonprofits, and other organizations around you to practice good cyber hygiene, to make sure they are updating their systems and that everyone is encouraging one another to be vigilant about creating a secure environment. I thank you for your time, for your commitment, and thanks for clicking OK on that next update prompt. Thank you, Ethan. If only we could get into that space of thinking through our cyber hygiene like we think of our regular hygiene habits. I really can't agree more. And the biggest thing with that too is we're gonna dive back into passwords for a little bit. Um, because this is one of the biggest sources of vulnerabilities and one of the most challenging things to keep track of, please join us in welcoming Stephanie Carruthers, the chief people hacker from IBM's X-Force Red Team. <laughs> Stephanie is a career whitehead hacker and is here to give us the tips the experts use to make and protect their passwords. Hi, my name is Stephanie Carruthers, or you can call me Snow. I'm the Chief People Hacker at IBM's X-Force Red. I'm so excited to be talking about passwords with you today. Now, to set the stage a little bit, my team and I were a bunch of hackers. We're paid by organizations to find flaws in their cybersecurity before criminals do. Now, with that being said, I wanted to say that I'm coming at this from an attacker point of view. As I'm talking about passwords, I'm also going to be talking about how to make yourself more secure. So you might hear things like your password should be strong and secure or your password should be long and complex. But what does that actually mean? First, let's take a step back to really understand how criminals can crack or brute force passwords. So let's say you're signing up for a new website and you enter in your new password. Well, what the website does is it takes that password, it scrambles it all around and it saves it in a database. That scrambling process is called hashing. So if a criminal breaks in and steals all the hashes from that database, they can't just read your password. But what they do is they use really powerful computers and word lists. Now, each word on the word list is hashed as well. It has that same scramble. So what they do is they take your hash of your password that they got from the database and they run it against their word list. And once they find a match, they know exactly what your password is. Now, here comes in the, your password should be long and complex. So if you take a password that's only eight characters long and let's just say lowercase letters, that could take seconds to crack. Now, if you take a password that's 10 characters long, let's say eight lowercase letters and two special characters, that could take hours to crack. Hopefully you see where I'm getting at here. Take a password that's 12 characters long and a mix of random uppercase, lowercase, special characters, numbers, just this mix of things that could take years to crack, which is perfect. A criminal is probably not going to wait years for your password. They're going to move along to someone else. 
Now, what do I recommend? I say to be safe, 16 characters, and make sure it's that complex, that randomness. You want to make sure you cannot read any words or see patterns. The key here is the randomness. Now we're on to our next issue of password reuse. So let's say there's a website you log into often. Let's go with your bank. And there's another website you frequent just as much, maybe a social media platform. When you created accounts on these, they probably had some type of strong password requirement. So you use the same one on both websites. Now, maybe that social media platform had not a great security posture. An attacker was able to hack in, steal the hashes, crack your password, and they now have your username and password. Well, attackers are clever. They know that you probably use the same password through different logins. So they might try them at other places like your bank. Now, that is an issue, but to combat this, we can use password managers. Now, password managers is a place, think of it like a database that stores all of your usernames and passwords to every login that you have. Now, there's many options for password managers. Most of them even have free tiers for the everyday consumer. So what you do is when you sign up for an account, it can be a little tricky, especially as you're adding in all of your accounts, but I promise you it's worth it in the long run. And even as you're signing up for new accounts, they do things like they generate those long, random, complex passwords for you, so you don't have to think of them yourself. They also autofill for you, so you don't have to go in and, and dig through things and try to find your password. There's um, lots of conveniences. They have mobile apps, they have browser plugins. They're definitely there for your convenience. So you might be thinking to yourself, great, I've solved a couple of issues. I know how to make a long, complex password to my password manager, and my password manager stores all of my unique login credentials. Now, what happens if an attacker actually gets the password to my password manager, or still another website that has a long, complex password, then what? Well, this is where multi-factor authentication comes into play. Sometimes it's referred to as two-factor authentication. Essentially how it works is if you log into a website and you supply your username and password, you still have to supply a second factor. Now that might be a code in a text message or something you have to approve on an app on your phone. There's different ways that this could work, but essentially if the attacker doesn't have that second code, they can't log into your accounts. Now it's really important that you deploy this everywhere you can across every account. Typically it's under a security settings in your account. Now, this isn't the silver bullet. Attackers are getting crafty. Sometimes if they try to log into your account and you do have 2FA, what they might do is launch a social engineering campaign against you. They might call you claiming to be the bank and they need to verify you. So you need to confirm a code that you just received or they might text you and say, hey, I used to have this phone number. I accidentally sent my code to you. Can you give it to me? Under no circumstances should you ever give out this code. No organization is gonna call you for your multi-factor code or for your password for that matter. All right, a couple of takeaways. Your password should be at least 16 characters and random. The randomness is key here. You should also have a different password for every account you log into. You can use a password manager to help you do this and even help you generate those long and complex passwords. And also enable two-factor authentication on every account possible. Thank you so much for your time and keep doing what you're doing to keep ourselves and our community safe. Thank you. Stay safe. explanation, Stephanie. While 16 characters may be a little daunting, think about it this way. If you use a password manager, and there are several now, examples include LastPass, Keeper, or Dashlane, then you really only have to come up with one super complicated password, and that will help keep you way more secure online. And to that point, the next thing we want to talk about is encrypting emails and files and backing those important files up. Those are thrown together because they're complementary, and they both help protect you against things like malware attacks or in case someone does get into your stuff. And so our presenter on this issue is NCC board member Leslie Kershaw from Siren Solutions. And we're excited for her to share her 20 plus years in cybersecurity to talk through encryption and backing up files. Hello, 
my name is Leslie Kershaw, and I've spent 20 years in the field of cybersecurity. First, as an NSA offensive cyber operator, using attack methodologies to gain access to systems on behalf of our government. Later, I used those insights to help commercial entities harden their defenses. What I've learned over the years is that security measures cannot be overly cumbersome, otherwise users will not implement them. While the best security is to avoid technology altogether, that's just not realistic. The other thing that I've learned over the years is that no matter how good your security, a determined attacker given enough time, resources, and incentive will gain access to the systems and information that they want. For you, this means that you should do your best to implement tools that make it difficult for an unskilled or moderately skilled attacker. When faced with advanced aggression, the best solution is to formulate a good recovery plan. Today, we'll talk about encrypting email to prevent sensitive data from being viewed by unintended recipients. We'll also talk about how to back up data so that you can recover if you are the victim of, a, of an attack. Before the internet, we relied on the Postal Service to deliver messages for us. When we were on vacation, we would send those glossy postcards filled with details about the fun times that we were having. We didn't care if anybody saw them. When faced with difficult news to share, we would write a letter and fold it into an envelope. We may even buy envelopes that had additional security to protect the sensitive information of our writing. When we think of our email messages, we should think of them in the same way. Unencrypted email is that postcard that anyone can read with limited tools and knowledge. When we communicate sensitive information, we need to use encryption to wrap our message in that protective envelope. There are three mechanisms that you can use to encrypt messages. I'll go from the simplest methodology to the most difficult. The first is through enterprise encryption. This will be set by your organization's IT staff. The encryption will leverage S-MIME, which allows for the encryption of any type of data that you would like to send. They will issue you a signing certificate that can be tied to your email. Once you install this, you'll simply check the encrypt email button or the lock button to encrypt your email message. As long as your intended recipient's organization also supports an encryption management server, you can send and receive without issue. Leveraging this will take care of 80% of your sensitive communication. If you want to send an email to someone who does not have encryption management at or their organization, or you just want to add an extra layer of protection, you can encrypt the document itself. To do this, if you're on a Windows system, you can select to WinZip the document and then add the password. If you're on a Mac system, you can just set a password under, under a file. Make sure that you send the password over the phone verbally or through a text. Do not send it in the email because if an attacker has access to the recipient's email, they can unencrypt your message. The last method is to use PGP on your email account and exchange keys with the intended recipient. The install and use of this goes beyond the time that we have left in this video, but there are great resources on the internet that can help you. The only drawback of this method is that it only encrypts plain text emails. Encrypting emails will help you thwart lower level attackers that attempt to pry into your personal data. Advanced attackers will use sophisticated methods to access your information and may even try to cause damage. Trying to recover from an attack is an emotional and time-consuming endeavor. It's best to prepare for it potentially happening by treating it like insurance. You build up the method to recover knowing that you might someday need it. Imagine that you knocked over a cup of coffee onto your computer right now and it won't restart. How would you recover all of that data? The simplest method is to back up your data in an automated way. Once the automation is set, you will never have to think about it again until it's time to recover. I like to use an external drive that I connect via USB to my USB docking port. That way, anytime that I connect my laptop to my external screen, which is also on my docking port, I'm setting up the automated backup without even thinking about it. If you're using a Windows system, just go to your system, then settings, then updates and security. 
you'll select that external drive that you just connected via USB. You'll set the interval and the backups will begin. If you're using a Mac, you have two methods available to you. The first is to connect to iCloud. You'll select the drives and the documents that you want to be automatically updated and they'll take care of that for you. The good thing about that methodology is that you can also access those files on different devices. You can also set up your Mac for external drive automated backup in a similar way. You'll just go to System Preferences, select the time machine, and follow the prompts. I hope that you never have to recover your files or that you're a victim of an attack. But if you are, I hope that this helped you prepare. Have a great day. Well, thanks again for all your tips, Leslie. And I think one of the interesting things that helped me quite a bit, actually, is this idea of setting calendar alerts to help back up my devices regularly mm -hmm. and check that everything's working right. So that was something I took away for sure. No, absolutely. We set calendar reminders for everything else, so why not our backups? All right, well, we have the final topic coming up next, and that is how to avoid clicking on things you shouldn't and what to do if you accidentally did. To share about how to protect against this, we're pleased to welcome Google's Sunny Consalvo, Researcher and Security and Privacy User Experience Team Lead. Sunny, thank you so much for being here. Hi, I'm Sunny Consalvo a researcher at Google who focuses on security, privacy, and abuse topics. By now, you've learned a lot about how to avoid email phishing campaigns. So in this module, we're gonna dive a bit more deeply into how to be aware of what not to click on when it comes to web pages and what to do if you accidentally do. Let's be honest, we've all done something we shouldn't have. We've all clicked that link. You know, the one that takes you to a shady website or starts to download something onto your computer. So what are some ways to avoid doing that? First, let's talk about how you might figure out that you're on a shady web page. One side might be that if you try to leave the page, you get bombarded with a pop-up asking you some version of, are you sure you wanna leave this page? Or maybe install our antivirus program. That should be a red flag right there. Another sign might be that you get a pop-up to sign up for more information, especially if it's hard to click out of that before you've even reached the actual content. If the site is only mildly shady, be careful to not share any personal information or sign up for anything on your way out and just X out of that tab. But if it won't let you out, try closing out of your browser entirely. If that doesn't work and you're on a Windows computer, go to your Start button and look for your Task Manager. From your Task Manager, look for your internet browser in the list, select it, then end that task. If you're on an Apple computer, go to the Apple menu, select force quit, then look for your internet browser in the list and force it to quit. At this point, it would be a good idea to open your antivirus software and run a scan. If you're unsure how to do this, check in with your legislative IT staff or your personal organization's IT staff to walk you through those steps. Though you may end up on less savory sites through simple internet searches, Another way can be from links you receive in an email or text message. Before opening a link from a text, make sure you know who sent it to you, that it's someone you trust, and then it really is them who's sending it. If you don't know who it is or are suspicious that it might not really be who you think it is, don't open it. You can always contact the sender another way, for example, by giving them a call, just to make sure it's not a phishing attack. And when it comes to email, there are several tools you can use to proactively scan for malicious links or attachments. If you want to check where the link leads to, hover over it and make sure you recognize the source and that the source in the hover matches what's in the email. It's a good idea to check the source in your internet searches too, to make sure the domain you're about to click on is the right one. Most email platforms now have some type of alert or warning to draw your attention to a potentially suspicious content. With Google's Advanced Protection Program, for example, even more stringent checks are performed before you try to download something. Advanced Protection flags and may even block file downloads that may be harmful. These steps to protect yourself aren't done in a vacuum. Remember to keep all of your software, apps, and devices updated. 
and ask IT for support in installing trusted antivirus software, firewalls, and email filtering. And of course, always back up your files. Criminals can't make you pay for information you already have. If you think your computer or device may be acting in a strange or suspicious way, or if you're simply unsure whether something is wrong, reach out to IT for help. Stay alert, practice good cyber hygiene, watch the other videos in this series for more information about what to look out for, and whatever you do, if you're not sure about it, don't click it. Thanks so much for your time. Your diligence keeps us all safe. Thanks again, Sunny, for another incredibly helpful video. And another key thing to remember as you're looking at some of these various sites is whether there's a padlock at the top left of your URL or where the web address is where you type in things. Um, and if there is one, chances are it's more secure. So again, thank you. And thank you for your time. We know that all of you are extremely busy. And so again, the online option is always available to you at cyberforstateleaders.org. Um, and please remember to take the short survey that will be sent to you to get your certificate to show your commitment to cybersecurity. We will be tracking these certificates by state, so please be sure to make your state proud of as many certificates as possible. Just like Secretary Frank LaRose said, let's make Ohio the best place for cyber in the US. And again, if you have a state leader in mind that you think we should sign the cyber charter, please email us at cyberforstateleaders at cyber-center.org. Um, all of you here will be automatically added to our newsletter that will share ongoing security tips and access to different roundtable discussions on various issues. So please feel free to share that newsletter with your colleagues and constituents if you want to have them get some extra tips. Um, and lastly, we're going to finish out with any Q&A if there is any. And it looks like we don't have any, so that's OK. <laughs> but I want to close out by saying that we genuinely hope that you learned something um, and that you can incorporate some new habits into your cyber routine. And we look forward to staying connected. And as a final note of grat gratitude, I want to thank uh, Secretary of State Frank Lowe's, Chief Information Officer Irvin, uh, what is his last name again? Rogers. Rogers, see? It's one of those things, you stay on here for a while and you, you do that. Um, Sec Senator Sykes and then Representative um, Carfagna. What is how you spell his name? Carfagna. Carfagna. There we go. Perfect. We look forward to everything you guys do. Thanks again for your time. We appreciate all you do to serve the great state of Ohio. Thank you. Thank you.